Hello, and welcome to the Taos Moses Core online tutorial on machine translation in Moses. My name is Barry Haddo, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Edinburgh. In this first module, I'll present a brief overview of machine translation, and in subsequent modules, we'll discuss how these principles can be applied in real world applications using the Moses machine translation system. The field of machine translation research is almost as, as old as the field of computing research itself. For soon after the first computers were developed in the 40s, people asked if it was possible for them to translate human languages. This was based on recent advances in, in linguistics and also the success on code breaking in the Second World War. For instance, that Warren Weaver in his famous memorandum of 1949 likened the, the translation of Russian to English as the reading of a secret code. Re research mainly on rule-based systems continued throughout the 40s and 50s and included famous demonstrations such as the IBM Georgetown experiment in 1956, which appears to show a successful machine translation. However, by the 60s it was realized that these, these systems were very limited in scope, only being able to translate a couple of hundred words. And this culminated in the, in the ALPAC report, report of 1966, in which the US government decided that there wasn't much point continuing with research in machine translation, so this effectively killed research in the US for well over a decade. However, the development of systems continued in other countries, and in particular, commercial rule-based systems became available, such as the first version of Systram. With the advent of increased computing power in the 1980s, and also the success of data-driven methods in speech recognition, various data-driven approaches to machine translation were developed, in particular the IBM models, which were word-based systems, and the example-based MT, which was developed in Japan. However, these, these couldn't rival the, the quality of the, the best rule-based systems at the time. Rule-based systems continued to dominate until really until the 2000s when phrase-based machine translation was developed. And this, for the first time, was able to outperform rule-based systems in many situations. This, this led to, to an explosion in machine translation research and a landmark in the late 2000s when Google launched their online translation system based on phrase-based machine translation. And another landmark in the late 2000s was the first version of the open source system Moses, which was released in 2006. The first MT systems were all rule-based. It was noted very early on in MT research that simple dictionary lookup was not sufficient as languages differ in structure. So because of this, rule-based systems use various linguistic tools to analyze the source language, and rules are handwritten by language, linguists to translate it to the target language. So in this example, a simple rule is applied to, to translate a French noun adjective combination to an English adjective noun combination. In a real system, rules would have to deal with a much more complicated phenomena than this one. The big advantage of rule-based systems is that, in principle, the output can be exhaustively explained in terms of the rules applied, and so any errors and inconsistencies in the translation can be fixed by adding appropriate extra rules. However, to achieve broad coverage, Rule-based systems have to contain huge numbers of rules, and so because of this, they're very expensive to create and maintain and require a lot of specialist knowledge. And because of these large numbers of rules, they're not really that transparent because it can be very difficult to track through all the rules that are applied to produce a given translation. In recent years, data-driven and especially statistical approaches have come to dominate in all areas of natural language processing for example in parsing, information extraction, and information retrieval. And as we shall see, they've also become dominant in machine translation. The fact that we can learn from data means that it's much easier to adapt to new problems and new domains, and we can have much better coverage than rule-based approaches. For MT, data-driven approaches enable us to learn systems for new language pairs very easily, given the appropriate textual resources. Statistical MT systems are trained by converting a text into a probabilistic model so that finding the best translation is equivalent to finding the most probable translation. And this sl slide shows a typical text, for example, the Rosetta Stone, producing a translation system, in this case, Google Translate. In, today, statistical MT systems are state-of-the-art for most translation scenarios. Although it has to be noted that the very best systems often include some rule-based elements, for example, to deal with dates or numbers or, for, or to deal with morphology. And such systems are sometimes known as hybrid systems. An alternative way of classifying MT systems 
is according to the level of abstraction at which they operate. One way of representing these level, levels of abstraction is the Vauquois pyramid, as shown on this slide. At the bottom of the pyramid, we have methods that op operate only on the surface form, in other words, they only consider the text, and they don't use any higher level of abstraction. The these methods include phrase-based machine translation and example-based machine translation. In the middle of the pyramid, we have methods that operate at the syntactic level. They must perform first perform some analysis on the text to create a syntactic representation, and then apply some transforms in this representation, then finally regenerate surface text from the transformed syntax. At the top of the pyramid is interlingua. The idea of this is that every language can be analyzed into a common semantic language, then the syntax, and finally the text generated in the target language from the interlingua. Interlinguas are not used much in data-driven approaches. They really, really apply to rule-based approaches. However, like all models, we must remember that the Vauqua pyramid is a simplification, and many of the current syntactic approaches don't fit in easily into this model. For example, they may take the surface form of the source language and generate target syntax and target language directly from this at the same time. Now it's time to look in more detail at the components of a statistical machine translation or SMT system. The diagram in this slide shows the two main parts of an SMT system, training and decoding. The training pipeline is a collection of tools which take in large quantities of training text in the form of parallel corpora or monolingual corpora, and we'll explain what a parallel corpus is in the next slide. And the pipeline creates an SMT model from these corpora. The training process is normally a batch job and can take a long time, for example, hours or even days. But recently, methods have been developed for incrementally updating SMT models, incorporating small amounts of new training data. At runtime, the decoder uses the SMT model to translate the sentence. The decoder uses the model to score all possible translations and chooses the best, or rather the highest scoring, translation. As we mentioned in the last slide, parallel corpora, also known as bytexts, are vital to the training of SMT systems. The training pipeline usually requires a sentence-by-sentence -sentence correspondence between the two languages in the parallel corpora, such as in the example above. During training, the sentences are aligned at the word level using a statistical model which exploits the co-occurrences in words, and translations are then extracted from this word-aligned corpus. It's possible to convert a document-aligned corpus into a sentence-level sentence aligned corpus using heuristic tools, although this, this procedure is somewhat inexact. There's many freely available parallel corpora which you can download from the web. For example, those produced by multilingual public bodies such as the EU and the UN. And also, dictionaries can be used as sources of translations for MT systems. The SMT model consists of several components. For example, models to improve reordering and make sure the length is appropriate. But the two most important components of the SMT model are the translation model and the language model. The language model is built from monolingual data and only in the target language, whereas the translation model requires parallel corpora, which is generally in shorter supply than monolingual, create, than monolingual data since it needs to be created by translators. The language model is used to guide the SMT system towards output which reads well in the target language, whereas the translation model predicts translations of source words or of short segments. So roughly speaking, we can associate the translation model with adequacy, in other words, assuring that the, that the translation preserves the meaning of the source, and the language model with fluency, in other words, assuring that the translation makes sense in the target language. But unfortunately, there's lots of interaction between the two models, so we can't, for example, directly correlate improvements in the language model with improvements in fluency. Focusing our attention on language models for the moment, the dominant method is to use n-gram models. These models are relatively simple, but actually very effective. They can be trained with huge quantities of data, for example, billions or even trillions of words, if it's available and they work by assigning a probability to each word based on a fixed number of preceding words known as the history. So they can't actually deal with any kind of long distance phenomena, but because of the local aspect they're very fast, um, and this is, this is actually very important during decoding. Engram models have to use various techniques to deal with unknown and rare words, and this is known as smoothing. Language models incorporating different levels of syntax have been used to, and are often used in research systems, and they can help. But these are not really mainstream in MT. 
So we've mentioned phrase base empty a few times, and this slide gives a flavor of how it works. This is the first statistical model to really challenge rule based MT, and it's still state of the art for many language pairs, forming the basis for, for instance, Google Translate. In its pure form, it doesn't incorporate any linguistic knowledge, but the source side is broken up into phrases of varying sizes, although they're not strictly speaking phrases, they're a segment would be a more accurate term. And e each of these phrases is translated separately using the translation model. As the decoder builds up the translation, it's free to choose the phrases in any order, although the language model will help guide the system to produce fluent output. And there's also, going to, there's also normally some model of phrase reordering. So in this example, we can see that, for instance, non-linguistic phrases can be used, such as the German phrase Spaß am, which is translated as fun with the, and phrases can be reordered, reflecting the differing verb order and constraints in the two languages. Since phrase based MT doesn't represent the structure of the languages, other approaches have been developed more recently to try to improve on this. For example, hierarchical machine translation is a reasonably straightforward extension of phrase based MT, which allows X's to be inserted into the phrases. The X's can then be replaced by any other phrase pair at translation time. There can be more than one X, which allows re reordering to be represented. Hierarchical MT then can represent structural correspondences, for example negation in French-English, as in the example shown in the slide. It should be emphasized that hierarchical MT doesn't include any linguistic syntax at all. Hierarchical MT is typically better when there's a lot of structural differences between the two languages, for example translating from Chinese or Japanese into English. It's well supported by open source MT toolkits, but it's not so well used in commercially possibly because training and decoding are much more resource intensive. Syntactic MT uses, for example, a parse on source or on target or in both to help extract the translation rules. There's many variants on syntac syntactic models and it's not clear what the best practice is at this stage. Good results have been achieved, but syntactic MT is mostly in the realm of research at this moment in time. Whatever flavor of MT you employ, Training an SMT model typically involves many steps. The first task is corpus preparation, and the importance of cleaning and preparing the data should not be underestimated. This can include, for example, sentence aligning, or, e or the checking of the sentence alignments, splitting sentences in into individual tokens in a consistent way. For European languages, this means tokenizing, but for many Asian languages, which are written without spaces between the, the characters, there's some sort of segmentation required. Corpus preparation can also include putting sentences into an appropriate case, dealing with character encoding issues, and possibly inserting placeholder for numbers, dates, URLs, or other such elements which are to be handled separately. Once the models are estimated, in particular the language model and the uh, translation model, they must be weighted against each other. This process is known as tuning, and it can actually be one of the most time-consuming time parts of building an SMT model. Once you have an SMT model, it is able to assign a score or probability to every possible translation. So the job of the decoder is simply to find the highest scoring translations amongst all possible translations. However, the number of possible translations is actually so vast that there's no way to search them exhaustively. So the decoder uses two main tricks to make this search practical. The first trick is to decompose the translations so that they're built up and scored piece by piece. This is a lossless technique for, for the normal types of translation models that we use. The second trick is to prune the translation space so that only a fixed number of possibilities are considered at each stage of the search. This method is an approximation. In other words, the highest scoring translation may be pruned out during the search process. With these two tricks, we can make decoding tractable. So that brings us to the end of the Principles for Machine Translation tutorial. For further tutorials in this series, please go to the web address shown in this slide. Thank you for listening.